Ilhan Omar complains about a video of a Christian ministry singing about Jesus on an airplane during Easter weekend. The media continue to panic over Elon Musk's attempted Twitter takeover, and Disney is quietly backing away from its woke aggression. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. I talk about them every single show. Why haven't you gotten a VPN yet? Get ExpressVPN right now at expressvpn.com slash Ben. We'll get to all the news in just one moment. First, you're just spending too much money on your cell phone bill. So inflation is taking tons of money out of your pocket these days. And there are a bunch of corporations that hate you and you're giving them lots of money. Well, why don't you solve both of those problems, at least in a small way, by heading on over to Pure Talk USA. Would you rather overpay for cell phone service every month to a company with left-wing values or pay about half with Pure Talk and support a company that actually likes your values? It's time to ditch Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile. Pure Talk has the same 5G coverage as one of the big guys, but saves the average family over 800 bucks a year. I made the switch. What exactly is your excuse? You can keep your number, keep your phone, or get huge discounts on the latest iPhones and Androids. Unlimited talk text, six gigs of data. It's just 30 bucks a month, or you can get unlimited data and still save yourself a fortune. Head on over to puretalk.com, enter promo code Shapiro. You will save 50% off your very first month of coverage. That is puretalk.com, promo code Shapiro. Pure Talk is simply smarter wireless. I switched over to Pure Talk. It's great. You should do the exact same thing that I did. And again, stop giving your money to a bunch of corporations that don't like you and then waste your money on a bunch of marketing that why should you pay for that? Just pay for your cell phone coverage instead. That's puretalk.com. Enter promo code Shapiro. Save 50% off your very first month of coverage. Well, this weekend marked a major holiday for two of the three major world religions. Ramadan is also this month. So actually, all three major world religions are involved in celebrating holidays this month in a wide variety of ways. This week marks Passover for my folks, the the religious Jews. It marks Easter, Sunday marks Easter for Christians. And the religious nature of the weekend, it's a very good thing. It's a, let me just put it out there. We need more public religion, not less public religion. We have a mental health crisis in this country right now, particularly among young people. It is not a coincidence that as church going has declined across the United States, you have seen an uptick in mental health problems. It is not a coincidence that the social fabric of the country has been fraying the less people go to church and the less people go to synagogue. In other words, public practice of religion has always been a deep core need in the United States. And this has been true since the time of de Tocqueville. There was always the belief in the United States that the liberties that we enjoyed had to be placed against the backdrop of a public practice of religion that made people feel duty bound to one another. That if there was no social fabric, the liberty that we supposedly prized was going to rip away all of that social fabric. Liberty would act as universal acid in the absence of the base, right? And what you need for the base is religious practice in the United States. As John Adams suggested, the Constitution was made for a moral and religious people only. For any other people, it would be like a whale breaking through the boundaries of a net. It just would, the, the constitutional limitations on government would just be broken through by any other group of people. You need a moral and religious people. The reason that I bring this up is because as always, whenever there is a religious weekend, there's an all out assault, particularly on Judeo-Christian religion by the media. And I do separate off here Islam because the media is very, very shy about criticizing Islam in the same way that it does Christianity or Judaism. It is not close. Now, maybe there will come a time when the media changes and realizes that religious Muslims are actually religious and they start hating on Muslims the same way they do on Christians and Jews. But that time has not yet come. I bring this up because Ilhan Omar, who is a rabid anti-Semite and quite a terrible person, she tweeted out a video over the weekend of a group on a plane that was playing a a Jesus worship song on this plane. And this video had like 30 million views. And the video itself appears to be, the context is it's not super clear, but TMZ reports the original video was shot by a guy named Jack Jens Jr., who leads a group called Kingdom Realm Ministries. The original posting appears to have been deleted. It is unclear if the plane was privately chartered or if some of the passengers on board were, quote, a captive audience, according to the New York Daily News. Jens' Facebook timeline indicates his group is in Ukraine, is in Europe, seemingly supporting Ukrainian refugees. So not only are these people super bad for singing about Jesus, they're super, super bad because they're singing about Jesus while trying to save people from the predations of a Russian military assault on Ukraine, apparently, which means they're really bad. And this, of course, has greatly frustrated Ilhan Omar, who is a wild leftist in everything except for her own religious precepts, apparently. So Ilhan Omar promptly tweets, I think my family and I should have a prayer session next time I am on a plane. How do you think it will end? Okay, the answer is that if you are praying quietly on a plane, people don't really do anything. And the reason I know this is because I've prayed quietly on a plane before. 
Like I've gotten out the talus, I've, t- I've gotten out the tefillin, I've gone to the back of the plane. By the way, it would also depend on the airline, right? Ilhan Omar is acting as though all airlines and all locations are equivalent. So for example, you generally would not see Jews praying on a plane en masse on a United Airlines flight. On El Al, flying to Israel, this happens all the time. If you're on a flight to Qatar, or you're on Qatar Airlines, there is public prayer on the airlines to Qatar or on Turkish Airlines. Right? This sort of stuff does happen fairly regularly, depending on which airline you are under. But, but her real point is not the supposedly evil discriminatory nature of the United States. Her real point is, why are these Christians being allowed to pray on a plane? That is really what is upsetting her. And again, I don't know why you would find this video particularly upsetting. This is literally just people who are singing about Jesus on a plane. I and mean, here's what the video sounded like. By the way, that singing on the airplane right there, that is a chartered flight that Ilhan Omar is complaining about. That's not even a public flight where people are sitting there being quote unquote subjected to this. That is a chartered flight and she's whining about it. We'll get to more on that in just one second. If all of this nonsense disturbs your sleep, I have a solution for you. You need Helix Sleep. I just tell you, my kids are waking me up at 5.20 every single morning. The only thing that saves me is the fact that I have a Helix Sleep mattress. And the magic of Helix Sleep is that they make this two minute sleep quiz and they will match you to that customized mattress that gives you the best sleep of your life. Helixsleep.com slash Ben to take that Helix sleep quiz. Here's the thing. In pretty much every area of your life these days, you can get the thing that you need personalized for you. Well, you're spending eight hours a night on your mattress, or if you're me, six hours a night on your mattress, or if you're Bradford, because he has a new baby, like 20 minutes a night on that mattress, you need a Helix sleep mattress that is actually going to be the best it can be made just for you. Whether you need a firm mattress or a soft mattress, whether you sleep hot, or whether you just want a mattress that is going to make sure that you're in back pain in the morning, Helix Sleep makes this magic happen for you. Get the same mattress I've got, but, you know, made just for you. At helixsleep.com slash Ben, take that two-minute sleep quiz. They will match you to a customized mattress that gives you the best sleep of your life. Ten-year warranty. Try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll pick it up for you if you don't love it, but you will. Helix even has financing options and flexible payment plans, so a great night's sleep is never far away. Again, they're offering 200 bucks off all mattress orders, two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash Ben. Head on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Get started today. So the reason that I bring this up is because there's an overt attempt by a huge number of people in our society to destroy the public practice of Judeo-Christian religion. And it ratchets up every time we have a holy weekend, it ratchets up. So for example, the New York Times ran a piece over Passover weekend when the Orthodox Jews can't respond because we're busy, right? You actually are not allowed to use computers or electronics or any of that sort of stuff. And it was a piece by a person named Shalom Oslander, who was raised in Muncie, New York. He says that he was raised Orthodox. And the piece is called, In This Time of War, I Propose We Give Up God. So this is what we call the hot slate pitch right here. Right? The slate pitch is the part where you make a completely counterintuitive argument in the middle of somebody else's Holy Week. And all of this stuff sort of Ilhan Omar ripping on Christians who are praying in the air, and Shalom Oslander writing a piece in the New York Times about giving up on God during Easter weekend and Passover weekend. Now, all of this stuff, as we'll notice in just one second, again, only seems to apply to criticism of Judeo-Christian religion. It does not seem to apply to other sorts of religion. If you insult other people's religions, then this means that you're mean and very bad, and then you ought to be punished publicly, as we'll see in just one second. So Shalom Oslander writes this. This weekend, Jews around the world will celebrate the holiday of Passover, the name of which comes from the story of God, quote, passing over the homes of our distant ancestors on his way to slaughter the firstborn sons of evil Egyptians. Our forefathers, the story goes, marked our doorposts with lamb's blood in order to spare their own sons the awful fate of their enemies. In this time of war and violence, of oppression and suffering, I propose we pass over something else, God. Okay, this is a super unsophisticated and dumb piece that is basically along the lines of John Lennon's Imagine, the worst song ever written, not only for its garbage piano chords, but also for the idiotic lyrics, mainly for the idiotic lyrics, all about how if you get rid of God and get rid of nations, then suddenly there will be world peace, which turns out to be just nonsense all the way through. And one of the things you might have noticed is that in this time of war and oppression and suffering, very little of it has to do with overt religious practice. Vladimir Putin is not attacking Ukraine for religious reasons. China is not threatening Taiwan for religious reasons. In fact, as it turns out, atheistic, communistic countries or countries of the communist past seem to be particularly aggressive at this point in time. But, writes Shalom Oslander, two aspects of the Passover story have troubled me since I was first taught them long ago in an Orthodox yeshiva in Muncie, New York. 
I was eight years old, and as the holiday approached, our rabbi commanded us to open our Chumashim, or Old Testaments, to the book of Exodus. To get us in the holiday spirit, he told us gruesome tales of torture and persecution. The Egyptians, he told us, used the corpses of Jewish slaves in their buildings. You mean they used slaves to build their buildings, I asked, and the slaves died from work? No, said the rabbi. They put the Jewish bodies into the walls and used them as bricks. My father was something of a handyman at the time, and this seemed to me a serious violation of basic building codes, not to mention a surefire way to lose a home sale. Ah, ha, 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 ha. Is this brick, the interested couple asked? No, no, says the realtor, that's corpse. But just as troubling, even more so today in light of the brutal slaughter taking place in Ukraine where the plagues themselves. Okay, so my favorite thing in religious practice is when a bunch of people who abandon religion in their teenage years and really never seriously engaged with religion other than what they were taught as very small children suddenly become experts in all theodicy. It's, it's really amusing to me. It, like it never occurred to him that maybe what was taught to an eight-year-old was meant to be symbolic, that the idea of Jews being used, for example, in the bricks of the pyramids, which again, this is not a midrash that I'd heard. I'd heard this with regard to the Tower of Babel and not with regard to the pyramids, but that's usually because it's meant, midrash is, is not meant to be taken completely literally. It's meant to be taken figuratively. So maybe it is about the disrespect for the lives of the Jewish slaves who are being used to build Pharaoh's storehouses, for example. But this never occurs to him, right? He has to take it as literally as possible in order to disparage the religion. He says, just as troubling, even more so today in light of the brutal slaughter taking place in Ukraine or the plagues themselves. God, the rabbi said, struck all the Egyptians with his wrath, not just Pharaoh and his soldiers. Egyptians, young and old, innocent and guilty, suffered locusts and frogs, hail and darkness, beasts running wild and water becoming blood. Mothers nursing their babies, the rabbi explained, found their breast milk had turned to blood. Yay, my classmates cheered uh, because the classmates are now evil because they heard about the Bible. This sort of you know, kind of pathetic biblical analysis is really stupid, particularly because there's a lot in Jewish tradition that specifically talks about the problems of collective punishment and why collective punishment happened with regard to the Egyptians in the Exodus story. Right? There's talk about complicity. There's also talk about the responsibility of the leadership for its own people, right? There's a part in the Exodus story, I mean, it's straight in the book of Exodus, where the people come to Pharaoh and they say, it's time for you to give up. And Pharaoh says, no, I can't give up. We're going to continue along these lines. Right. There's part of the Pesach, the, the, when we just did this, the, the Passover Seder, the Pesach Seder, in which you have a, a cup of wine. And as you mentioned the plagues, you're supposed to take a little bit of the wine out of your cup for each plague, because that's supposed to symbolically represent the fact that your cup is less full because people had to suffer in order to free the Jews. There's a famous Midrash. I mean, if he's going to cite Midrashim, there's a famous Midrash in which the angels are celebrating at the splitting of the Red Sea and the Egyptians being drowned, and God tells them to stop because he says, those are my creations too. So there's been a long question in Jewish history and in Jewish philosophy about the nature and morality of collective punishment along these lines. But of course, none of this matters to him. This is the thing about so many of our, of our atheistic friends. They hijack biblical morality and they live off of the roots of biblical morality because otherwise, where is this morality coming from? And then they use it to attack the Bible. So the idea is they imbibe from the great stream of moral history that springs from Judeo-Christian practice. And then they look back down at the foundation. They say, all those foundations are bad. All those foundations are terrible. We should rip them away. If we just stop practicing religion, then everything would be all better. So says Shalom Oslender, I was raised strictly Orthodox, old school, shtetl fabulous. Every year at the beginning of the Seder, we welcome in the hungry and poor Jews who can't afford to have a Seder themselves. It's a wonderfully human gesture. A few short hours of God later, at the end of the Seder, we open the front door and call out to him, pour out thy wrath upon the nations that did not know you. Because the idea is that those are the people who are going to victimize you. I mean, the, the idea is, I mean, you have to put this in the context of Jewish history, where that specific paragraph, Shafok Hamascha, is specifically directed at people who are, you know, carrying out pogroms in the streets against Jews which was sort of the history of the Jewish people, as we'll see, continuing until today. And God does, says Shalom Oslinder, with plagues and floods, fire and fury on the young and old, the guilty and innocent, and we humans made in his image do the same with fixed-wing bombers and cluster bombs with self-propelled mortars and thermal barrack rocket launchers. So somehow he's linking up the God of Passover to Vladimir Putin firebombing cities. He's going to have to explain that link. He doesn't explain that link because that link is not explicable. Vladimir Putin is violating biblical precepts. There are very few Christians on planet Earth who think, wow, what Vladimir Putin is doing is really a reflection of the best that Christianity has to offer this Easter weekend, which is why the Pope was out there condemning Vladimir Putin over Easter weekend. But says Shalom Oslinder, killing gods is an idea I can get behind. This year, at the end of the Seder, let's indeed throw our doors open to strangers, to people who aren't our own, to the terrifying them, to the evil others, those people who seem so different from us. Oh, the humanism, oh, the humanism. Okay, so again, the New York Times runs this over Passover weekend. And Ilhan Omar is ripping on people singing about Jesus while in flight. Everybody seems to be okay. There doesn't seem to have been any hijacking attempts on that flight. 
She's very upset about all of that. But by the way, I have to say, Ilhan Omar, the irony of people who are purportedly religious, like Ilhan Omar is, and I don't know how religious she is. She seems to be differential in her practice, depending on you know her, her marital life and all of that. But let's assume that she's a religious Muslim. If you are publicly practicing your religion, it seems to me at the very least, you should be tolerant and celebratory of other people who publicly practice their religion. I, for example, have said that Ilhan Omar should be able to wear hijab while she is in Congress. I've said she should be able to be sworn in on Quran. And I've said that because when it comes to people publicly living out their religion, I think that is generally a good thing for the world because I'm a person who publicly lives out my religion. I think it's a very good thing. when pe I want more people to go back to church. I'm not somebody who goes to church. I go to synagogue. But I've said publicly, I think that the future of the United States relies on people going back to church. I want more planes filled with people singing about Jesus at 30,000 feet in the United States. I think that is the only way that the country re-imbibes from the moral precepts of the Old and New Testaments. And that would be very good for civilization, as opposed to the sort of secular, atheistic, hedonistic narcissism in which we are currently embroiled, and which is not only sacrificing our children, but is also sacrificing our foreign policy to secular, atheistic countries like China which is a predatory human rights violator on every possible level. But it is amazing how on a holy weekend, the media sort of get together and it's like, well, the, the holy weekend, yeah, maybe we'll pay lip service to the holiness of the weekend, but really those people are pretty barbaric and they're pretty bad. So this columnist who is now suggesting that somehow biblical religion is responsible for Vladimir Putin bombing Ukraine, that guy is an idiot. And you know what else you don't need to deal with? Other idiots you don't need to deal with? The guy at the auto store. So you end up waiting in line for a very long time. You finally get up to the front. And it turns out Beta O'Rourke is behind the counter. He's like, bro, I lost my gubernatorial race and I work here now. You're like, well, that's that's weird that you work here now, Beta. He's like, yeah, man, well, I can sell you this auto part. You're like, well, how? It's not here at the store. He's like, right, I'm going to order it on the onlines, bro. Kick, flick, bong, rip. And you're like, well, but then it's going to take three weeks to get it. He's like, right, and then I'm going to upcharge you. Or you can not deal with Beta and head on over to rockauto.com for your auto parts. Rockauto.com only sells auto parts and related tools. They've been doing it for over 20 years. Their unique intuitive catalog includes photos, specs, installation tips. They make it easy to choose the correct parts for your specific vehicle. They not only have the auto parts you need, they'll give you a selection of trusted name brands to choose from. You can pick brakes that match how you use your vehicle, whether that is for towing, racing, or just commuting to work. Get suspension, exhaust, air conditioning, and other kits that provide the parts you need for a successful repair. And their prices are always reliably low. That means they don't change prices based on what the market will bear like airlines or marketplace sites do. Go to rockauto.com for your auto parts. Write Shapiro in there. How did you hear about us box? So they know that we sent you. Again, that's rockauto.com. Write Shapiro in that. How did you hear about us box? So they know that you were sent by this magical show. Now, there's one group of people who is fully exempt from this sort of analysis. And that is the media's treatment of Islam. The media's treatment of Islam is soft bigotry of low expectations kind of stuff. The basic idea is that if Muslims go crazy over something that Christians and Jews never would go crazy over, this is because Muslims have been duly offended. For example, here is a headline from Sweden over the weekend. Quote, this Axios, far-right groups, Quran-burning plans trigger unrest in Sweden. Right, that is the, that is the headline. So what you would think is that the real problem here is people burning Qurans. Now, listen, I'm not a fan of people burning Qurans. I'm not a fan of people burning Bibles. I'm not a fan of any of that. As Roger Scruton, the conservative philosopher from Britain, wrote, you know, there's a certain baseline level of civility that you should generally have for other people's religion. It makes for a better world. However, if somebody burns a Quran and your response is to riot, you are the bigger problem than the person who is building the Quran, the, the, the person who is burning the Quran. Reuters, by the way, is doing the same thing. Right. If you look at the Reuters headline, they say this riots erupt in Sweden's Orebro ahead of right wing extremist demonstration. So the riots are in response to the right wing extremist. If you just remove the cancer of the right wing extremist demonstration, well, then none of this would ever happen. So what exactly happened here? What happened here is that there was a right wing group in Sweden. Sweden has had a serious problem with criminality among the Muslim immigrant population in Sweden. Malmo, Sweden has basically become unlivable for people who are Jewish, for example. Lots of hate crimes pursued against people who are Jewish in Sweden. A huge amount of crime in Sweden is driven by immigrants who are coming in and are unemployed. And a lot of those immigrants are coming from northern African countries, Arab countries as well. Axios says, clashes erupted in Sweden for a fourth straight day Sunday after a far-right group announced plans to burn the Quran at rallies. At least 16 law enforcement officers have been wounded and several police vehicles destroyed in clashes between far-right demonstrators and counter-protesters since last Thursday in Stockholm and other cities where the group Strom Kurz or Hardline planned to hold events. Now, again, notice the language here. 16 law enforcement officers have been wounded. 
several police vehicles destroyed in clashes between far-right demonstrators and counter-protesters. So who are the counter-protesters who actually are uh, engaged in the rioting? They are generally not the far-right extremists. What happened is that during Ramadan, a far-right group planned events to take place in which they burned Qurans. Unrest has been reported in several cities over the Easter weekend, including in Norrköping in Sweden's east, where the police said Sunday three people were wounded as officers fired warning shots into a crowd. The southern town of Landskron saw stone throwing and objects set alight Saturday night after Stromkurs moved its demonstrations in the nearby city of Malmo. Again, as I mentioned, Malmo is now a heavily uh, Muslim city in terms of population. Twelve officers were wounded and four police vehicles set alight in the central city of Orebro Friday ahead of a demonstration in which Stromkurs planned to burn a Quran, according to AP. Okay, so um, you may have noticed that nowhere in this article does it say who actually is attacking the cops and burning things. Nowhere. Right, so uh, it turns out that a lot of the people who are attacking cops and burning things are people who are protesting and upset at the burning of the Quran, not the people who are actually burning the Quran. Kim Hild, spokeswoman for police in southern Sweden, said earlier Saturday police would not revoke permission for the Landskrona demonstration because the threshold for doing that is very high in Sweden, which values free speech. The right of the protesters to demonstrate and speak out weighs enormously heavily, and it takes an incredible amount for this to be ignored, said Hild. The demonstration took place Saturday evening in a central park in Malmo, where Strom Kurz leader Rasmus Paludin addressed a few dozen people. A small number of counter-protesters threw stones at demonstrators. Police were forced to use pepper spray to disperse them. Paludin himself was reported to have been hit on a leg, on his stone, uh, by a stone on his leg. No serious injuries were reported. Since Thursday, clashes have also been reported in Stockholm and in cities of Linköping and Norrköping, all locations where Stromkurs either planned or had demonstrations. Now, again, notice the media coverage here. There's a soft bigotry of low expectations. People who riot because a Quran gets burned are treated as though they are not even part of the story. The real problem is just the burning of the Quran. Now, if you're going to have that sort of respect for public practice of religion, that we are now going to have tremendous sympathy for people who riot every time there's a cartoon of Muhammad drawn or a Quran burned, and I would suggest that you extend at least a modicum of that respect to the religion that undergirds Western civilization, Judeo-Christian religion. But of course, that is not how this works. Instead, it's just low bigotry. It is the soft bigotry of low expectations kind of nonsense. And you see this every time there is a clash in Israel, for example. So over the weekend, there are also clashes in Israel. This has been pushed forward by the Palestinian Authority as well as Hamas. So basically what's happening in the Middle East right now is that thanks to Barack Obama and Joe Biden attempting to reach out to Iran in the perverse view that if you give billions of dollars to radical Iranian mullahs who wish to murder as many Jews as humanly possible and take over surrounding countries and attack the Saudis, that if you give them a bunch of money and a pathway to a nuclear bomb while allowing them to develop ballistic missile technology, this will moderate them. What has happened in the Middle East is a complete reorientation, a complete shifting in which a bunch of Sunni Muslim countries have now effectively made alliances with the Israelis. They've said, listen, our big problem here is not the Israeli-Palestinian issue because the Palestinians are supported by the Iranians and because, frankly, we've been using them as pawns for several decades in order to redirect from the outrage of our own citizens and in order so that we can use them as a tool against Israel. So maybe the problem isn't the Israelis, maybe the problem is the Iranians. And thus the Abraham Accords under the Trump administration where you have the UAE and Morocco and a bevy of other countries really kind of backed by Saudi Arabia, entering into full-scale recognition of the state of Israel and now significant economic ties. And so the Palestinians have responded, as they generally do. The Palestinian Authority, the Hamas leadership, have responded by encouraging rioting in Jerusalem, knowing that the media are now going to treat that with the soft bigotry of low expectations. Now, speaking of media coverage that is just garbage, the media continue to pretend that inflation is all going to be okay. It's not going to be Okay. In fact, the mortgage rates right now are rising at record rates, which means that if you wait around for a really long time, you are making a large scale mistake. This is why you need to go check out American financing today. You still have access to rates that are near the record lows, but they're not going to be that way for much longer, like at all, which makes now the time to get that free mortgage review from American financing, America's home for home loans, where you will learn about custom loans that can save you up to a thousand bucks a month. And you need to do it right now, because again, the interest rates are headed the wrong way, folks. From lower rates to shorter terms, even debt consolidation, their salary-based mortgage consultants can do all of it for you, and they don't charge upfront or hidden fees. So why not learn more? If you like what you hear, you can pre-qualify for free, possibly skip two mortgage payments. You might close in as fast as 10 days. Just call 866-721-3300. That is 866-721-3300. Or visit AmericanFinancing.net. Again, that's AmericanFinancing.net, NMLS, 182334, consumeraccess.org. Go check them out today at AmericanFinancing.net and see how much money you can save at AmericanFinancing.net today. So what happened over the course of the past several days 
is that spurred on undoubtedly by Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, a bunch of rioters all up on the Temple Mount, and I've, and I've been up on the Temple Mount. Okay? The Temple Mount is heavily restricted. It is run by the Waqf, the Islamic Waqf, for years, for decades. Jews were prohibited from openly praying on the Temple Mount. Even when I was up there, Jews were not allowed to openly pray on the Temple Mount. I'm talking about standing there. If you stand there and they see your lips move, they will literally deploy the Islamic Waqf to kick you off the Temple Mount. I know because this happened to the group that I was in when I went up to the Temple Mount. In fact, it happened to be a Jewish holiday. It was actually during the Jewish festival of Sukkot. And one of the days is called Hoshana Rabbah. During that day, one of the things that happens is that you take essentially a, a set of willow branches and you beat them on the ground. It's just a ceremonial ritual that has some meaning. Don't need to get into it. And one of the guys we were up there with, he took these out of his pocket and he started hitting them on the ground, literally taking branches and hitting them on the ground. The Islamic Waf came over. A bunch of women started approaching from both sides, shouting Allahu Akbar. A bunch of young men who were unemployed, young Arab men were up there and they ran over to start screaming at us. And the Mishtara, the Israeli authorities, literally threatened to arrest this guy for the great sin of taking some branches and hitting them on the ground. In an area, by the way, where Muslims pray every day. In fact, Muslims even have a school up there on the Temple Mount, which is the holiest site in Judaism, because unfortunately for centuries, Islam has had the, the bad habit of finding any holy site of, of any religion and then just building a, a mosque right on top of it, which is why you have the Al-Aqsa Dome, the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the, um, on the edge of the Temple Mount complex, and why you have the Dome of the Rock built directly where the Kodesh Kedoshim, the holiest site in Judaism, would have been, right? The center of the temple. There's a reason why this is now a Muslim holy site and all of that is the case. Okay, so every time the, the, there needs to be a distraction from world politics or an attempt to cudgel Arab countries into not making peace with Israel, there's an attempt to start a riot on the Temple Mount. And so the Al-Aqsa Mosque is used as a staging ground for these riots. And you can see it in the videos. People literally bring baskets of rocks into the Al-Aqsa Mosque and they start hurling them at the Israeli police officers who are on the Temple Mount to guard people who are touring the Temple Mount and also to make sure that violence does not break out up there. And then the media cover it as though the Jews have somehow initiated the violence, like the Jews are randomly going into the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The Jews, the, the Israelis over there, they have no interest in going into the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Okay, the the Al-Aqsa Mosque has been protected by the state of Israel literally since its inception, right? From 48 to 67, there was not even any control, Jewish control of the old city of Jerusalem. From 67 on, when Moshe Dayan handed the keys to the Temple Mount, to the Islamic Waqf, Israeli security forces have been protecting Muslim worship on the Temple Mount and not protecting Jewish worship on the Temple Mount. In fact, one of the most discriminatory places on earth for Jews is the Temple Mount, the holiest site in Judaism, presided over by the state of Israel, which delegated its power to the Islamic Waqf. The reason that I explain all of this is because the media coverage is that when Muslims riot on the Temple Mount in an attempt to shift attention away from the bad governance of Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, or an attempt to refocus the eyes of the world on the supposed suffering of the Palestinians, who again are living, the vast majority of Palestinians live under the direct rule of Hamas and the Palestinian Authority. So instead what they do is they start riots in order to try and blame Israel. The media instead treat it as a question of moral equivalence, which it is not. And this follows, the, the riots on the Temple Mount follow several weeks of gun and knife attacks on Jews leading up to Passover. And these gun and knife attacks, again, have been celebrated by Hamas. Hamas has issued statements on the stabbing to death of civilians, the, shoot, the mass shooting of civilians. Candies are handed out in the Gaza Strip and in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, ruled by the Palestinian Authority. And the media just don't cover this because the soft bigotry of law expectations that applies to Muslim countries continues. And so that is the latest from, from Israel. I mean, the Palestinians, like four days ago, vandalized Joseph's tomb. And one of the holier sites in Judaism, Joseph, like from the Bible, is in the West Bank city of Nablus, which is the Arab name for the city. And uh, Palestinian rioters decided to just go and set fire to the site, which they do every so often. Every so often they find a Jewish site that happens to be in sort of a Palestinian area and they break it and they set fire to it. This happens fairly regularly. The vandalism came amid the second night of arrests made by Israeli security forces in the West Bank following a deadly terrorist attack on Thursday night on Dizengoff Street in Tel Aviv that claimed three lives. The terrorist, Ram Hazem, at 28, was from a nearby Palestinian city of Jenin. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett said, we will not accept this kind of attack on a place that is holy to us, particularly on the eve of Passover. We will reach the rioters. Of course, we'll make sure to rebuild what they destroyed as we always do. And again, this is an area that is completely ruled by the Palestinian Authority. So they vandalized Joseph's tomb. Again, again, this happens fairly regularly. And um, in response, the Ram Party, which is part of the current coalition in Israel, right, the, the supposed apartheid state of Israel, 
one of the parties that is part of that coalition is an Arab party called the ROM, the United Arab List. They, quote unquote, froze their participation in the coalition to protest, quote, police violence against Palestinians in Jerusalem, which is probably eventually going to bring down the government. Because as it turns out, when you side with people who are rioting against the existence of the state of Israel, which is what is happening, then it's hard to hold the coalition together. Meanwhile, Hezbollah is on Israel's northern border, backed by Iran, and saying they only need $9 billion to destroy Israel. Mohammed Rab, the head of the Hezbollah parliamentary bloc in the Lebanese parliament. Okay, these are people who sit in an actual parliament in Lebanon. They now say the resistance needs only $9 billion. There will be nothing left called Israel in the region. Hey, the reason that I bring all of this up is, again, when it comes to media attacks on religion, some of these things just don't make headlines ever. There's just a soft bigotry of low expectations that applies to the Muslim world. And that soft bigotry of low expectations means that secularists in the West will attack Judaism and Christianity. And when it comes to Islam, then Islam gets a pass. And if Muslims anywhere do anything that is violent or terrible, the idea is the West must somehow have caused all of this. Now, this does stand in kind of stark contrast to how the left is treating the situation in Ukraine. It's kind of fascinating, right? Ukraine is a, is a Western country. Russia is a non-Western country. Russia is attacking Ukraine. And the left has sort of rushed to the defense of Ukraine, using arguments, by the way, that apply to Israel in, the, in their totality. They'll say, you know, Ukraine is a, is a sovereign territory in which areas are being carved off by, by people who are engaged in terrorist activity. Yeah, that's a pretty good description of what's happened in the Gaza Strip and Judea and Samaria. And there's an idea that Ukraine should never, ever surrender any territory to Russia, because after all, Russia is the negative power in this region. Yeah, but bottom line is that, you know, again, when, when it comes to foreign policy, there's real inconsistency, and the inconsistency seems to be largely predicated on the notion that has arisen in the West that religion is bad. Religion is not bad. Yeah, religion is generally very, very good for human beings. We have a religious instinct. That religious instinct is quite important. Pretending that it doesn't exist is ignoring a fundamental factor in human life. And again, that does not mean that all religion is created equal. It doesn't mean that all religions are equally true or equally good. It does mean that before you pull the trigger on, on your article in the New York Times about how God needs to go away, perhaps you should think about what a world without God actually looks like. It doesn't look all that good. Okay, meanwhile, the situation in Ukraine continues to deteriorate. Apparently, Mariupol is completely surrounded at this point. The Russians have completely surrounded it. According to the Wall Street Journal, the last Ukrainian troops holding out in besieged Mariupol rejected Moscow's ultimatum on Sunday that they surrender or face destruction by Russian forces as Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky warned an all-out Russian assault on the troops would endanger further peace negotiations. Russia had given the troops until noon local time to lay down arms and observe a seven-hour ceasefire it said would allow them to leave the battlefield unscathed. Russian forces are close to capturing the strategic ports after weeks of heavy bombardment. In fact, the it seems as though there is a war in the east that is going to get significantly heavier as well. The Wall Street Journal says Russia's expanding military deployments in and around eastern Ukraine in recent days are setting the stage for a new phase of Moscow's offensive, one that is likely to be very different from the kind of fighting that has characterized the past two months. This time, the two countries' militaries will be operating on open terrain well-suited for mass forces and armored thrusts. Russian forces will, all be will also be fighting in closer proximity to their bases in western Russia, giving them significantly shorter supply lines and on territory their commanders know better. Zelensky, for his part, is saying we are not going to surrender a single inch of Ukrainian territory, which is yeah, what was likely to happen in the end here, by the way, is a sort of a North Korea, South Korea situation in which a rump Ukraine is, is left without the Donbass region, without Crimea, in which Russia solidifies its gains. I thought before the war, this was actually Russia's initial goal. Instead, it turned out that, that Putin went for broke and this was his plan B. Zelensky is now warning about the possibility that Vladimir Putin might use nuclear weapons. Here's what he had to say. The director of the CIA warned that he's worried Putin might use a tactical nuclear weapon in this fight. Are you worried? There is a possibility of them using these weapons. Nobody expected there to be a full-scale invasion of Ukraine from the Russian Federation. No one expected there to be a war in 2014. And now that there will be a full-scale invasion and killing of civilians, nobody expected them to invade the areas where there is no military equipment and just kill and shoot dead the civilian population. Meanwhile, Zelensky is ratcheting up the rhetoric. He's calling on Joe Biden to come visit Ukraine now that Boris Johnson has visited Ukraine. There are already some American congressmen who have visited Kiev as well. Here's Zelensky saying it's time for Joe Biden to come. You want President Biden to come here? Yes. Is yes. There, are there any plans for him to come? I think he will. 
You think I he think, will? I think he will. And I think he, but it, it's, no, no, I mean, it, it's his decision, of course, and, and about the safety situation, it depends, I mean, that, but I think, I think he's the leader of the United States, and that, that, that's why he should come here to see. Okay, meanwhile, again, Zelensky has been ratcheting up the rhetoric pretty dramatically here. You know, he, he's trying to invoke the Holocaust. He's saying, we don't believe those who say never again, again. There, there's something kind of deeply, I would say, odd about the leader of Ukraine, even if he is of Jewish extraction, talking about never again in the context of a nation that was fully complicit in the Holocaust itself. And again, I, I, I've never bought into this idea that when the world says never again, we actually mean never again. I don't think that's true. I think that, that very little foreign policy is actually driven by human rights concerns. Most foreign policy is driven by hard-headed real politics and the necessity for political and military and economic might and creating spheres of influence. Now, those spheres of influence are not all morally equivalent. An American Euro sphere of influence is significantly better than a Russian Chinese sphere of influence. However, the, the sort of idea that, that never again was ever a global priority is just not true. I mean, there are a million Uyghur Muslims being held in abject servitude over in China right now. There's ethnic cleansing that happens in Africa on a pretty regular basis. So uh, you know, whenever people cite human rights violations, uh, I, I, I start to get a little skeptical that this is a real rationale. It, it, it's good press. I mean, I understand what he's doing. Uh, I just don't think that the world takes this sort of rhetoric particularly seriously. Every year on Holocaust Remembrance Day, politicians put out statements that say never again, never again. Those statements must seem really hollow right now to you. When the world says never again, do they ever mean it? I don't believe the world. After we, we see what's going on in Ukraine. Okay, by the way, I mean, Ukraine has voted several times to, 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 to essentially undercut the state of Israel in its own defense against a genocidal terrorist who wished to destroy it. So, and never again is, is not a priority for, for pretty much anybody. What, what will happen in Ukraine right now? It feels like we are getting drawn into a, a conflict in the East that looks less like protecting Ukraine and more like a protracted battle with the Russians. In other words, it might be that there's a bit of opportunism that's also going on here to reverse some of the things that, that never should have been allowed to happen back in 2014. I don't blame Zelensky for this, but the West is going to have to decide what its priorities are and how far it's willing to go in order to pursue those priorities. In other words, we want to get into a contracted, uh, protracted conflict over, for example, large swaths of the Donbass region that were already carried out by, by the Russians in 2014. Do we want to get involved in a conflict in Crimea? Like, how far is this repelling the invasion that has already happened? I'm full scale on board with that. If this turns into protracted Western support for reversing the gains that Putin made in 2014, you're going to have to assess the cost benefit analysis of that. I understand what, what Zelensky is doing. I don't blame him whatsoever for that. But the West is going to have to figure out what exactly its interests are and where the off ramp is throughout all of this. Because remember, Vladimir Putin is the kind of person who would use a tactical nuclear weapon. And so when you have Senate Democrats out there saying things like the United States should think about sending troops to Ukraine, and I think it's a pretty, this is Chris Coons from, from Delaware, it's a pretty dangerous suggestion. If Vladimir Putin, who has shown us how brutal he can be, is allowed to just continue uh, to massacre civilians, to commit war crimes um, throughout Ukraine uh, without NATO, without the West uh, coming more forcefully to his aid, um, I, I, I deeply worry that what's going to happen next is that we will see Ukraine turn into Syria. Mm -hmm. The American people cannot turn away from this tragedy in Ukraine. I think the history of the 21st century turns on how fiercely mm -hmm. we defend freedom in Ukraine and that Putin will only stop when we stop him. Okay, I mean, I, I generally agree with all of that. I'm just wondering where Chris Coons was when Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine back in 2014 and where he was when Vladimir Putin decided to take control of Syria and Barack Obama went totally along with all of that. All right, in just a second, we'll get to the latest on Elon Musk's attempt to take over Twitter. But first, folks, one of the impacts of the situation in Ukraine, of course, is those spiking gas prices. Most of that is Biden, but some of that is the situation in Ukraine. Bottom line is this, you're spending way too much money every time you fill up the tank these days, which is why you need that free Get Upside app. My listeners are earning cash back for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download that free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now. Use promo code Shapiro for 25 cents per gallon or more on your first fill up cash back. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Download the app for free. Use promo code Shapiro for 25 cents per gallon or more on your very first tank of gas. And it's not just for gas. You can earn up to 30% cash back at grocery stores, restaurants, and food delivery too. You can cash out anytime to your bank account or get an e-gift card for select retailers and brands. Again, 
Download that free Get Upside app. Use promo code Shapiro. Get 25 cents per gallon or more cash back on your first tank of gas. Joe Biden is really intent that you spend more money on your gas. Get Upside is trying to fix that for you, at least in small part. Go check them out right now. Get that Get Upside app for free. Use promo code Shapiro. Get 25 cents per gallon or more cash back on your very first tank of gas. Again, use that promo code Shapiro right now. That is promo code Shapiro when you get that free Get Upside app in the App Store. All righty, if you liked season one of my series debunked, I am pumped to tell you there is more. I've gotten a lot of questions about this. When is season two happening? It's coming. I've been working on season two. It is pretty awesome if I do say so myself. In it, I expose leftists for the fraud they are in only 15 minutes or less. And I will give you the tools you need to dismantle their unsubstantiated, silly arguments. The first episode debunks the common leftist talking point, the rich don't pay their fair share. It will be out next Monday, April 25th. If you're not already a Daily Wire member, head on over to dailywire.com slash subscribe. You can binge all 10 episodes of season one right now. I created this show to give you the confidence to counter every argument your crazy leftist friend throws your way. I cannot wait to debunk 10 more arguments this season over the coming weeks. Join at dailywire.com slash subscribe right now and get season two of Debunked. It's even better than season one. You're listening to the largest, fastest growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. Meanwhile, Elon Musk's bid to take over Twitter has now been stymied by a poison pill that Twitter is putting in its documents. According to the New York Times, Twitter does not want to become a plaything of the world's richest person. I love that the media are now pretending that very rich people don't run places like the New York Times. It's owned by the Sulzberger family. Like there's this bizarre, crazy wording here. It's like Twitter doesn't want to be the plaything of a rich person. What do you think? It's owned by a bunch of poor people, Twitter? Like the, the, the folks at the, over, over at the local homeless shelter are setting the algorithms or what? Or is it a bunch of billionaires? On Friday, according to Lauren Hirsch and Kate Conger of the New York Times, Twitter turned into a tried and tested corporate defense mechanism invented in the 1980s, the heyday of the corporate raider, to block a potential takeover attempt by Elon Musk and buy its board some time. The mechanism, known as a poison pill, has a simple intention, to make it less palatable for a potential buyer to pursue the target company if the buyer accumulates shares above a certain threshold. In Twitter's case, if Musk bought more than 15% of the company, Twitter would then flood the market with new stock that all shareholders except Musk could buy at a discounted price. That would immediately dilute Musk's stake and make it significantly more expensive for him to buy the company. Musk currently owns a little more than 9% of Twitter's stock. Twitter said its plan would be in place for just shy of one year. The tool will not stop the company from holding talks with any potential buyer and will give it more time to negotiate a deal that Twitter's board believes best reflects the company's value. So the board of Twitter is going to decide not the shareholders of Twitter. The strategy doesn't mean the company is going to be independent forever, said Drew Pascarella, senior lecturer of finance at Cornell. It just means they can effectively fend off Elon. Twitter is weighing whether to invite bids from other people to other people close to the company, said. So apparently they're now trying to sell to someone else because all they are looking for at this point is just somebody who is not going to change the algorithm so that it doesn't discriminate against conservatives. Silver Lake, a private equity firm that already owns a significant stake in Twitter, could be a possibility, people said. Silver Lake, a technology-focused buyout fund, has more than $90 billion in assets under management, and a managing partner there, Egan Durbin, sits on Twitter's board. Silver Lake has come to Twitter's rescue before. In 2020, when Elliott Management, an activist investor, amassed shares in Twitter and wanted it to make changes, Silver Lake helped the parties reach a compromise. As part of that deal, Silver Lake invested $1 billion in Twitter. Well, uh, let me just explain that is not the same thing as Elon Musk offering, what was it, $43 billion? Not $1 billion, $43 billion in order to just buy it straight up. At least one other private equity firm, Tama Bravo, is weighing a possible offer for Twitter, according to Reuters. Poison pills have become part of a corporate toolkit in America. Netflix adopted a poison pill in 2012 to stop Carl Icahn from buying up its shares. Papa John's used one against the pizza chain's founder and chairman, John Schnatter, in 2018. Investors rarely try to get around a poison pill by buying shares beyond the threshold set by the company, according to securities experts. One said it would be financially ruinous, even for Mr. Musk. Okay, but the, the fact that the media are celebratory about this demonstrates what exactly their priorities are. And of course, their real priorities are making sure that Twitter is just an outlet for all of their preferred beliefs. Because without a monopoly on the media, they've got nothing. If people actually get to say what they think, the left loses so much of its momentum in the culture wars. This is why you have Democratic strategists coming out and this Danielle Moody telling Al Sharpton, who again, unbelievable, it will never stop being unbelievable to me that Al Sharpton has his own television show. I mean, the man is the, the worst race baiter of the last half century. It's unbelievable. This Democratic strategist is telling Al Sharpton, who himself has been involved in no less than two riots, that Elon Musk is a danger to free speech. 
Elon Musk is a danger to Twitter and to freedom of speech. He has been known to say some of the most transphobic and homophobic things to his millions of followers. So creating an arena for hate, to me, that's what that sounds like, an opportunity for him to have no consequences, to have no flags for people just to be able to do whatever it is and say whatever they want, with regardless of what kind of um, uh, harm that it causes. Oh, my God. He wants people to be able to say and do what they want? Holy crap. That would be terrible. It'd be horrible if we had a, you know, like amendment in the Constitution that basically guaranteed the same thing. That, can you imagine how bad that country would be? That'd be a terrible country. It had an amendment that says you can say and do kind of what you want. And I love that, regardless of what harm it does, because speech to these folks is violence. Meanwhile, SNL, which exists at the mercy of a public willing to take its pathetic mockery, SNL is just, uh, the people who write SNL, they must just be interns at the White House because the material there is just garbage. So SNL over the weekend was suggesting the real reason Elon Musk wanted to take over Twitter so he can say the N-word. Because that, that, of course, that's really what this is about. It's not about suppression of obvious stories like the Hunter Biden story. It's about people wanting to say the N-word. Nailed it. Nailed it, SNL. Elon Musk <laughs> offered to buy Twitter for over $40 billion so he can loosen its free speech rules. That's how badly white guys want to use the N-word. <laughs> Because that's, that's, that's exactly how this is working. It's all about white guys who want to say the N-word. Now, if you wonder why the media are so upset about the possibility of Musk taking over Twitter, the answer is if they don't have a monopoly on the messaging, they've got nothing. Nothing. They need the monopoly on the messaging because it turns out that when people find out the truth about what it is that they are saying, people don't like it at all. So let me give you an example. The, the entire media decided that Florida's bill to protect parental rights and education was bad. All that bill said was no indoctrination in gender identity or sexual orientation from K through three. That's all it said. Okay, that, that, that is the wording of the bill. It never said don't say gay. It didn't say any of that stuff. The entire media just lied about it. And they lied about it because there were activist groups who had decided to lie about it. And the media and the activist groups are one and the same group. And then it turned out that thanks to social media and thanks to alternative outlets like the Daily Wire, and thanks to the fact that there are shows like this one, people actually found out what's in the bill. And this turned out to be a wild negative for the left. And the more information that is out there, the worse it is for the left. So the media were basically counting on their monopoly to be able to cudgel everybody into place. They tried to bully Disney, and they succeeded in bullying Disney into taking a position on this bill. And then they, they went even further. They forced Disney to have an all-hands meeting at which members of the Disney crew basically came out and said that we are mainlining a bunch of left-wing garbage into children's programming. And the media covered this because this is supposed to be a good thing. So, for example, there's an article in the New York Times today called Disney, built on fairy tales and fantasy, confronts the real world. The entertainment behemoth spent decades avoiding even the whiff of controversy, but it has increasingly been drawn into the political partisan fray. By whom? By whom? Was it by us here on the right who just wanted to take our kids to Disneyland? And not mind if our little girls were called princesses and our little boys were called princes? Was it us? The people who just want to be able to Watch Encanto without being bothered with the vagaries of gender theory? Is it, was, it, was it really us or was it a bunch of activists in the media and activists inside the company who have decided that they wish to reorient Disney toward a quote-unquote not-at-all-secret gay agenda, the direct words of one of the producers of The Proud Family over at Disney? I mean, the New York Times noticed that there's an active attempt in the children's programming to put this content in, quote, last summer, Muppet Babies, a Disney Junior series for children aged three to three to eight, gently explored gender identity, gently. Well, it's gently, according to the New York Times, so it's totally fine. You know, them saying that boys can be girls, girls can be boys, and boys should wear dresses, it's gentle, according to the New York Times, so it really isn't the problem. Gonzo dons a gown, defying a directive from Miss Piggy that girls come as princesses and boys come as knights. Out Magazine wrote that the episode, quote, just sent a powerful message of love and acceptance to gender-variant kids everywhere. The fighting will undoubtedly continue, says the New York Times. The Disney Pixar film Lightyear set to release in June depicts a loving lesbian couple, while Thor, Love and Thunder, arriving in July, will showcase a major LGBTQIA plus minus divided by sign percentage sign tilde character. Okay, so it's the left that cudgeled Disney into doing these things, and they continue to try to cudgel Disney into doing these things. There's an article from a person named Sean Griffin for CNN Business. He's a professor for film and media arts at Southern Methodist University's Meadows School of Arts. He's also the author of Tinker Bells and Evil Queens, The Walt Disney Company, From the Inside Out. And his recommendation is that Disney has to halt all investment in Florida, which good luck with that since Disney World is in Florida. So really, good luck with one of your major profit centers halting all investment in that. 
I really slow clap for this moron. Officially recognize gay days. So you should officially recognize and facilitate annual gay days so that children are subjected to as much sexual propaganda as humanly possible. These parks are designed, by the way, for children. Adults enjoy them. These parks are designed for children. And they must feature LGBTQIA2SLY plus minus divided by sign. More characters like this. LGBTQIA plus fans of Disney, says this columnist, have long identified with non-binary characters such as Ferdinand the Bull and Peter Pan and appreciated the campy flair villains such as Captain Hook and Maleficent. Well, I mean, if, if wow. Well, good for them. Okay, so they dragged Disney kicking and screaming into this fight. And Disney went into the fight because, number one, they have a bunch of woke employees and their CEOs are a bunch of cowards, like abject, pathetic, yellow-bellied cowards. And so they got dragged into this fight. And they got dragged into the fight on the predicate that the media was basically just going to echo chamber this thing. They were going to keep reflecting wild leftist values and nobody was ever going to notice. The problem is people have started to notice because the left is so radical in their perspectives on gender and sexual orientation that the idea of this stuff for adults, let alone for kids, is totally insane. I'm just going to give you an example, by the way, of how radical the left is. So Jack Turbin is a child psychiatry fellow at Stanford Medical School, which is just, my God, and a trans youth mental health researcher who writes for the New York Times opinion section. He tweeted the other day, quote, puberty blockers, temporary, reversible. And by the way, the evidence is not that puberty blockers are temporary and reversible. That is not what the evidence shows. There are serious open questions about the long-term health effects of puberty blockers. He says, puberty blockers are more benign than going through a puberty that cannot be undone. If you go through puberty, you see, you should be able to be so independent of your own biological sex that if you go through puberty, that is your body doing violence to you the secret Cartesian you that lives in your head. So puberty is more damaging to you than puberty blockers and then maybe carving a fake vagina into your body. If you can't see that, then you really need to reflect on your biases and whether you consider trans people at all when you form your opinions. Okay, my opinion is that it is a normal natural process for the human body to go through puberty. I don't know when this became wildly controversial. It is not even close to controversial. What should be controversial is the garbage being spewed by the left on this particular topic. Because medical transition is not a Sneetch's star on, star off machine. There's a horrifying piece by a guy named Scott Nugent. And when I say a guy, I mean a transgender man. Okay, so a, a she who got a bunch of surgeries and hormone treatments to look like a he by Scott Nugent in Quillette. And here is what this person says. Quote, at a recent gathering, a friend's daughter told us, I'm probably trans because I don't like female puberty. This instantly got my attention because I have known this child for years. I never saw any indication of her being trans. I innocently asked, why she would say that? Was it a joke, perhaps? She replied, quote, I don't like my boobs growing. And Reddit says I'm probably trans. That night, I tracked down these Reddit exchanges and my jaw dropped when I saw how many people in organizations were heavily pushing the possibility of her being trans. But perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised, given the way such attitudes have gone mainstreamed. This includes the pediatrician mom whose recent opinion piece for the New York Times was titled, quote, what I learned as the parent of a transgender child. For kids Googling this subject, the overall effect is the equivalent of one big glitter bomb going off on their screen. I write all of this as a 47-year-old transgender man who transitioned five years ago. I'm also a parent to three teenagers. Though I admire the good intentions of parents who seek to support their children, I have serious concerns about reckless acquiescence to a child's internet-mediated self-diagnosis. Many older transgender folks share these concerns too. He says, transgenderism, and I say he, she. She says, transgenderism isn't a vague feeling or a distaste for stereotypical roles. It's a serious internal condition that was, causes you to want to become a member of the opposite sex. Medical transition, such as the kind I went through, can enhance an illusion that helps some gender dysphoric individuals navigate the world with more comfort. It did for me. It was the right path for me, but I wasn't born in the wrong body. I was born female, but I didn't like it. So I changed my appearance at significant monetary, psychological, and physical costs with plastic surgery and hormones. My sex never changed, though. Only my appearance changed. Anyone going through this is in store for a brutal process. And we now have thousands of naive parents walking their children into gender treatment centers, often based on internet-peddled narratives that present the transition experience through a gauzy rainbow lens. During my own transition, this person says, I had seven surgeries. I had a massive pulmonary embolism, a helicopter life flight ride, an emergency ambulance ride, a stress-induced heart attack, sepsis, a 17-month recurring infection due to using the wrong skin during a failed phalloplasty, which is the creation of a fake penis that does not work, 16 rounds of antibiotics, three weeks of daily IV antibiotics, the loss of all my hair, only partially successful arm reconstructive surgery, permanent lug and heart damage, a cut bladder, insomnia-induced hallucinations, oh, and frequent loss of consciousness due to pain from the hair on the inside of my urethra. All this led to a form of PTSD that made me a prisoner in my apartment 
for a year between me and my insurance company, medical expenses exceeded $900,000. Whenever you question the maximalist activist line on trans affirmation, you're directed to the World Professional Association for Transgender Health or WPATH as a reference. But much of what you find there consists of vague phrases such as up to the doctor's discretion. Lupron, the hormone blocker some doctors seem intent on giving to kids like Tylenol, isn't even FDA approved to treat children with gender dysphoria. In 2001, the manufacturer pled guilty to fraudulent sales practices with regard to its marketing as a prostate cancer drug. We don't know yet its long-term effects off-label. Here's what we do know. The long-term use of synthetic hormone therapy shortens lives. Okay, so in other words, all of this is just nonsense pushed by the media, and they rely on the echo chamber in order to mirror that nonsense. And some of the actual medical data when it comes to gender transition is absolutely horrifying. There was a post that was going around yesterday. Uh, it, it, was, it was put up on Reddit and it said this, quote, I have no clue what to do. Daughter can't get the bottom surgery and is becoming suicidal. Quote, hello, I've always been in support of my transgender daughter. When she was still a boy and started expressing a want to be a girl, I did everything right. Therapists, then puberty blockers, everything. Now she is 20. Everything is falling apart. We had to hold off on the body of surgery because of cause, but now finally had enough and went and got several consults. All have said the same thing. The puberty blockers have left her with a micro penis. She has to get part of her vagina made with her colon. Well, one of her friends had that surgery. Even years later, it smells fairly colon-like. Obviously, my daughter is now distraught. She's in counseling, but is becoming worse and worse in her mental state, and I am frantic. On top of this, she has never had any sexual function, no urges, no erections, even when she tried masturbation to see if she could stimulate herself, nothing. The doctors, the doctors say this may not change after her surgery. Her dating life is dismal as well. We knew it would be hard, but it's impossible. Well, yes, of course, because the actual data on this stuff is horrifying. And when people find out the actual data, it turns out that they are horrified by all of it. And this is why Disney is now backing off. This is why when I mention the sort of insanity that is pushed by the left and the fact that they have to control places like Twitter, because if they don't control Twitter, they can't control the narrative. This is the reality. So there's a dog that didn't bark in the Disney, quote unquote, don't say gay story. And that is where all the other corporations. Remember when there was a, a bill in Charlotte, North Carolina, there's a bill in North Carolina that basically said public restrooms have to be separated men, women. And there is such enormous backlash from a wide variety of corporations that they ended up sort of reversing the bill. You remember this. You remember that in Georgia, when a voting law passed, including voter ID, a multiplicity of organizations ranging from MLB to Coca-Cola decided to get involved. When it came to the quote unquote, don't say gay bill in Florida, very, very few organizations decided to say anything. You know why? Because it turns out that when the American people push back against the garbage, corporations don't want to be caught in the crossfire. And Disney is still now starting to go silent. Disney is becoming completely silent in Florida. You know why? Because some Republican lawmakers in Florida are threatening to end a special tax district that has allowed the company to effectively govern the land on which Walt Disney World sits for decades. Members of Congress have called for Disney to be stripped of its original Mickey Mouse copyright, according to the Wall Street Journal. Politicians are campaigning for re-election on promises to stand up to Disney and other woke corporations. They say are promoting messages and taking stands that put them out of step with the values of Florida parents and voters. Fans and park workers protested outside the company's headquarters earlier this month. Others have used social media to call for boycotts against Disney's parks. Disney is now going silent. They've decided to decline to comment on criticism from lawmakers. Inside the company, some executives have expressed disappointment. Disney has become politicized. Had people familiar with their thinking? Good. Good. It turns out when, that when Americans respond to actual data and not the garbage spewed out by Reddit and Twitter, things get very ugly for corporations that decide to go along with the wokes. So bottom line is the reason that people in the media are so darn upset, like very, very upset with Elon Musk taking over Twitter possibly is because they have to maintain the monopoly. And the, the echo chamber is so strong. How strong is the echo chamber, by the way? I'll finish on this, but how strong is the echo chamber? The reason that it is so strong I mean, it is so strong that Jen Psaki, the White House press secretary, knows she's among friends so strongly she can go out in public and disparage a member of the press from Fox News as essentially the worst kind of human, knowing that she will face very, very little blowback in any real terms. I mean, the lady already has a contract with MSNBC and she's currently acting as the White House press secretary. Here she was a couple of days ago going after Peter Ducey from Fox News. So we have to talk about Peter Ducey for one second. Sure. Okay. Okay. Is he a stupid son of a <laughs> or does he play a stupid son of a on TV? <laughs> okay. Um, 
Well, um, he works for a, a network. Okay. That um, provides people with questions that nothing personal to any individual, including Peter Ducey, but might make anyone sound like a stupid son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> She thinks she can get away with that. Here's the thing. They've created a bubble of their own making. They can't get outside of that bubble. This is now under the dome by Stephen King. Bad things are about to happen inside that bubble for the Democrats. And if that bubble is ever burst, they will lose control even of the echo chamber they currently control. All righty, we'll be back here later today with an additional hour of content. In the meantime, go check out one of our newest podcasts, Morning Wired. Today's episode is available right now on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure to tune in. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. <laughs> The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Elliot Feld. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. And our production manager is Pavel Wydowski. Associate producer, Bradford Carrington. Editing is by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Fabiola Cristina. Production assistant, Jessica Crand. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. John Bickley here, Daily Wire editor-in-chief. Wake up every morning with our show, Morning Wire where we bring you all the news that you need to know in 15 minutes or less. Join me and my co-host, Georgia Howe, for daily coverage of all the biggest stories on Morning Wire. <laughs> 